Hi, I am Christopher Arnand, a professor at McMaster University, and I will be talking about design thinking. When you hear design, you probably think about architecture and fashion, something requiring genius or at least inspiration. I'm here to convince you it is something anyone can learn. Design thinking itself was designed through iterative refinement, and we owe a lot to Don Norman, an engineer who went back to school to learn psychology, invented the term human-centered design, and developed a lot of the vocabulary and methods we use today. He also wrote the best book on the subject. One area needing a lot of design today is software, and we have a whole field called human-computer interfaces. The name gives it away. Interfaces, between two faces. It's all about communication. What does it take to be good at it? What workout should you do? It turns out there is no muscle to develop, but there are neurons called mirror neurons. The monkey see, monkey do neurons we're all born with, and we need to learn and to cooperate. With practice, you too can develop an empathy superpower. So we all have innate skills to draw upon, good. But we also have a theory to back this up. We even have a Nobel Prize awarded for this science of the artificial, sometimes called design science. Just like chemistry and chemical engineering, there are two sides to this, theory and practice. The practice is design thinking. And whereas normal science is about understanding the world, design science is about understanding the limits of creation. Both depend on experiments, but instead of doing experiments to find out facts of nature, we are doing experiments to learn about possibilities and what our user needs. Design thinking is about understanding the user. But just like regular science, we often learn more from our failures. Oh, and if you don't want to tell people you're experimenting on people, we have another word for it, prototyping. In the end, you may produce something very different from your early prototypes. This is Shape Creator. It's what happens when you start with documentation and you let it mutate. It comes alive. Everything beginners need is here, and everything is explorable. Another example of mutating documentation is the double diamond. It came out of prototyping at the British Design Council, and it is really effective in using space to show two phases of design, each expanding out and exploring ideas and then converging to a single focus. In the first phase, we design the right thing, and in the second, we try to design it right. We start by interviewing users understanding their point of view, and understanding it better by doing research. Going every which way, our ideas are diverging, but that's good. When we have explored many directions, we can converge to a better problem definition. Now that we have a problem statement, we have to figure out the best way to solve it. Diverging again as we ideate and prototype. We may have to learn new tech or even new science at this point, but in the end, we need to converge our different implementation ideas into increasingly refined prototypes and gather user feedback. We have only touched on the ideas encapsulated in the double diamond, and soon you will be composing sonnets about each word and arrow in the diagram. But the best way to start understanding it is to put it into practice. That's why we've created templates so even beginners can start using it. We start with the empathy map. Every team needs a note taker to fill in what the user says, thinks, does, and feels. What they say is easy, but what they don't say or how they say it will also tell you about what they think and how they feel. If you cannot observe the user in their normal routine, it's a good idea to ask them to talk you through the steps. What they do may not match what they think they do. Talking through things step by step will help you understand what is really going on. Now, do it again. Even if your first user told you everything, it is good to interview three users, just to know that you haven't missed out anything important. If you are the interviewer rather than the note taker, you can tell at a glance whether you are missing some aspect of the user experience just by glancing at the quadrants. That's why they are there. Now, do it again. Even if your first user told you everything, it is good to interview three users to know that you haven't missed out anything important. If you are the interviewer rather than the note taker, 
You can tell at a glance whether you're missing some aspect of the user experience. Having interviewed your users and done your research, you're now ready to discuss what you've learned and formulate a how might we statement. To make sure you really cover your bases, we want you to write 15 ideas without judging them in any way. Then plot them on this impact versus novelty plot while you discuss them. This will ensure that you give them all a fair hearing and you may be surprised to discover new ways of combining them. We plot impact because we want solutions which can make a difference, and novelty because there's usually more value in solving an unsolved problem than improving on a solution which already exists. Now that you have your problem statement, you have to solve it. Again, to keep you from jumping at the first solution possible, we ask you to write down 15 possibilities, especially crazy ones. If you are stuck, try to find a million dollar solution and a 50 cent solution and a solution involving interplanetary travel. This time, discuss solutions with your group, plotting desirability versus feasibility, because we want a solution users will want to use, but we want to be able to finish it. Now you are ready to prototype. Don't make the mistake of building a final solution. Build a minimal solution from which you can collect user feedback. That is often a cardboard prototype, slides with your interface drawn on them, or a script simulating your interactive chatbot. With minimal prototypes and two to five trial users, you can get feedback and make improvements faster. Again, don't just ask users if you're great. We all know you are. Have them try to use the prototype. Record what they do not understand immediately as a question. Record what they like, what they want to change, and also write down their ideas. The triangle is a symbol for change in math. Again, having quadrants helps ensure that you get well-rounded feedback. They will probably have lots to say. You're definitely not finished, but do you have to go back and refine the implementation? Or do you have to go back and figure out what the real problem was, because clearly, the user didn't think you were solving it. Be brave and go back as far as necessary. The first time may be hard, but if you are participating in one of our workshops, you will not get lost and your mentors will encourage you to contribute your craziest ideas. Now you are ready to get better. And just like an Olympic athlete, you won't get better without focused practice. Discuss with your team what you can do better and focus on that at your next workshop. And in between design-a-thons, when you have a quiet moment, reflect on the main qualities which will make you the best design thinker you can be. Do you actively listen and really care about your users? Do you believe that you can solve their problems? Are you prepared to repeat the processes until you get them right? Are you overjoyed by failure? Because what you learn lays the foundation for greater success. Are you comfortable pursuing two paths in parallel? with a backup plan to hop to a third if your way is blocked? And finally, are you confident to say your craziest ideas out loud?